Number one. This happened when I was about 17 years old. I live in a small town, situated about half an hour away from the city. My boyfriend and I had gone to a movie that night and were heading home around midnight when we decided we would pull off the main road and head off to the boonies to have a bit of fun together. So, we drive for about 20 minutes and wind up at a dead end. My boyfriend had been going pretty fast down this road, so when we reached the end of it, we barrel into some bushes and tall grass, narrowly avoiding some trees. Slightly shaken, we sit there for a minute, and then eventually back out of the grass. We get ourselves out, and then pull over about 30 feet from where we had gone off the main road. There are no houses directly in sight, only private driveways with closed off gates. It's about 12.30 to 1am at this point, and it seems that there will be no one around, so we get down to business. I apologize for getting into too much detail at this point, but it is necessary for the story. The back of my boyfriend's car had limited space, so we would often open up the back doors to leave more room for fun activities. While I was in the back, I had my head out the door, and suddenly I heard some rustling coming from near the grass we had driven into. I think nothing of it, and forget about it for a few minutes. A little while later, I hear the noise again, this time coming from the trees. I stop my boyfriend and tell him to listen, and he hears it too. He attributes it to some deer and tries to continue. Me being easily frightened, I refused and sat there with the door open and listened. It was almost impossible to see very far through the tall grass, so eventually after some coaxing, we get back to it. After a few minutes, it happens again, but louder, and by this point I'm ready to leave. We both sit up, and just as we do, I hear something hurtling towards us. It sounded heavy on the feet, but also very fast. From what I could hear, it only sounded like two feet. I slam the door and practically shove my boyfriend to the front seat and scream at him to drive. The back door's window was open so I can hear this thing closing in on us and I'm just about ready to cry. I just remember the sound of the feet hitting the ground and everything else was silent. He starts the car and starts to back out when I see the grass just beside the car start to sway. While he's backing out, he spins the lights around and we can see this horrible thing running through the grass. I had initially figured maybe it was a bear that had strayed from the mountains or something when I only heard it in the woods. But the thing that we saw looked like a creepy old man that was naked and doubled over. I only saw it for a split second, so it really could have been anything. After my boyfriend and I had driven back to the main road, we discussed what it could have been. He thinks it was some old man that was upset we were in his land, and when we turned the lights towards him, we saw him trip, so we only saw his back being arched. I'm not entirely sure what an old farmer would be doing running naked through the woods, but I would like to think it was something less horrifying than some naked Bigfoot. Number 2 This happened to me when I was 16. I am a female in case that's important. I am 5 foot 3 and about 100 pounds. Not that intimidating at all. Anyway, my mother was in rehab at the time. Very sad because my mum had a really good job before she started drinking again. My dad then decided to pick up extra shifts until my mum got better. I was home alone most of the time, but I was actually very happy. I'm very social and I love to have friends over. Not to brag, but I had a lot of friends. I would have about 20 to 25 friends over at the most. Anyway, about 18 of my friends showed up around 8pm one night and we swam in the pool and chilled for a bit. Everybody went home by 10. One of my friends then decided to post a selfie of us on Instagram. The photo was taken when we were out on a walk a while earlier, and in the background you can see the name of my street. My friend texted me shortly after this with a screenshot of one of the comments on the photo. The comment was from someone we didn't recognize, 
and it said, I know that place. See you soon. I was freaked out, but not that freaked out. I let it go. At around 10:45 p.m., I was down in the wine cellar getting two liters of soda. I walked back up and noticed something weird. The radio we were playing music on earlier was now on, full volume. I assumed one of my friends had forgotten something, or was trying to prank me, or wanted to come back. I walked towards the back door and saw nobody. I was then convinced somebody was pranking me. I locked the back door and said, "Have fun, but I'm not letting you in." My back door and the windows next to it are large and see-through. I sat down on the couch a few feet away from the back door and started watching TV. A couple of moments later, I noticed something in the corner of my eye. It was a prime example of a stereotypical creep: somebody with a hood covering their face, black pants, black shoes. I then said, "Haha, very funny, Alan. Did Jessica put you up to this?" But he didn't move. Usually, when my friends pulled pranks on me like this, they would start laughing after I noticed them. I started to think, what if it wasn't one of my friends? That's when he ran to the door and tried to open it. I jumped and panic ran through my body. He then walked over to my plants near some area around my house, and I knew whoever this was was looking for a rock or something to smash through the door. I jumped off the couch. Grabbed my phone off the kitchen counter, and stopped. There was another guy standing at my front door. Tears started filling my eyes as I ran to the garage door. I went in and I was about to turn the garage door up, but it would make so much noise, and I thought they would run over here and kill me. My garage has a neat layout. The car is in the middle, and you have the garage door back there, usual. But there are two doors installed in the garage, right next to the car. One of the doors is a storage room filled with boxes, and another one is my dad's office. And I knew he kept a gun in there. I ran to my dad's office door, but it was locked. The keys were in the kitchen drawer. I tried to open it for at least thirty seconds, until I heard a glass shattering. I had no choice but to go into the storage room. I went in. But the door didn't have a lock on it. I hid behind a rack of boxes and hoped no one spotted me. That's when I heard a man's voice say, "I think she went in the garage." My heart dropped when I heard that. I was still somewhat hoping it was a prank. The garage door opened, and I heard walking from outside the door. One of the guys opened the door I was in. I was internally freaking out. Until I heard him say, "Nobody in here." And when they tried the office door, I heard someone say, "She's in here," and attempting to break the door down. I thought while they were busy trying to knock that door down, I could call the cops. I called them as silently as possible and told them my situation. I heard from the wall next to me, they were breaking the room apart, looking for me. The dispatcher told me the cops would be there in about three to four minutes. After what felt like forever, I heard sirens, and slowly a breath of relief came out. They were gone, but after a while they were caught and arrested. They looked at the guy's Instagram, and all of his photos were of true crime dead body photos. Ever since then, I hide all photos that can trace to where I am, and I always have the doors locked. Because I don't want to know what would have happened if the back door wasn't locked. My mum has also gotten clean and got her job back, and my dad is at home with me at night. Number three. On Friday night, I called my girlfriend to discuss what time I was going to pick her up in the morning. Because the drive is about five hours and is straight into the national park. We were planning to make it on foot into a valley behind a mountain that is traditionally only summited. The rest of the area is untouched, and there was a supposed lake at the base of where the valley is cut off by another mountain. 
I picked her up early the next morning and we headed out with every reason to be excited. The weather was looking perfect and we've both been stuck in the city for quite some time because of our jobs. We stopped to get lunch in the last small town on the way. We kept on driving for a couple of hours until we were in the heart of the mountains surrounded by thick pine and spruce forest. At this point, we hadn't seen anyone for at least 30 kilometers. It was exactly what we had wanted. When we arrived, we grabbed all our gear from my car, which was basically just our overnight backpack stuffed with our tent, foamy blankets, food, and bear spray, as well as a knife. We left the car at about 10 a.m., hiked up the right of a mountain onto the top of the ridge. From there, one could go left to summit, but we just continued down into the valley. There wasn't much of a beaten path, but we had confidence in our whereabouts because the valley is enclosed on one side, like a horseshoe, so you can always have reference. In the valley, there was a steady flowing creek, so we decided it was the perfect path to take to the lake. We walked until we felt like dinner time, so we decided to set up camp in a small clearing that was somewhat flat. I set up the tent as she began to make dinner. By the time we finished eating, it was almost dusk, and the bugs were out in full force. So, we decided to sit in the tent and play card games. I distinctly remember the sound of what sounded like a million bugs paired with a firm breeze flowing through the trees. It was tonic for my soul. Before we knew it, it was pitch black out, and we were almost ready to call it a night. I decided to hang the food in a tree at the wrong time, seeing as it was already dark but I thought it was the right call anyways. We went to sleep for what felt like a couple of minutes, before I heard something. There was a bear close to our tent. We sat in there in dead silence, me with the bear spray cocked. It got super close and even touched our tent a few times, but after a few minutes, it took off. Thank God. We decided to just stay in the tent and to try and fall asleep, It might have not been the best call, but we were terrified. I dozed off for a while longer, only to wake up alone in the tent. I panicked. She's not the type of person to get out of the tent to use the bathroom alone. She wasn't within sight, so I promptly walked towards the creek. To see her accompanied with her headlamp coming back, I slipped back into bed and shortly she came inside saying she was just using the bathroom and that she didn't want to wake me up. I was concerned, but too tired to really care anymore. The next morning was chilly, so we made oatmeal and sat around a fire I made. I asked her why she went towards the creek to use the bathroom within context of the night, and she called me crazy. I explained I saw her headlamp, and she just laughed, saying, You must have seen fireflies or moon reflections because she didn't go to the water, but the other way. At this point, I was just glad to keep on going after the close call with the bear, so I dismissed the thought, and we proceeded straight to the lake. It turned out to be more of a marsh this late in the summer, but it was still really nice and our spirits were up again. The evening weather was absolutely perfect, and we found ourselves having tea and indulging in some travel board games before wandering to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night and stepped out of the tent to pee. When I returned, Jen was gone from the tent. Again. I couldn't hear her, so I chose to look towards the lake. As I got closer, I noticed her headlamp again. She started to come back, and I was glad. It was all far too stressful to be happening in remote country. Just then... Another light appeared on the edge of the lake about 50 meters down shore, and it looked just like hers. The thought that Jen was right, I'm seeing things, quickly faded as the light close to me did too. And there I stood, thinking I'm losing it. The lights down the shore started to glide my way through thick bow rushes. Perplexed, I turned off my flashlight and watched it move into the forest for a second. Then, I ran back to the tent as quickly as one could in the dark. And there Jen was, in her sleeping bag. 
I asked her if she had seen the lights when she was out, to which she replied with a simple no and turned away from me. I grabbed the bear spray and stood outside the tent door with my flashlight, with my flashlight in hand. Mo- motionless and petrified, now there was something coming towards me and I could hear it. I pointed my light in its direction, illuminating a thick wall of trees and casting shadows behind them. Still, the noise of branches snapping and brush moving increased. Very slowly something came into view. It stood motionless for a few seconds, and with shaking hands I still managed to focus the light directly on it. At that point, I knew it wasn't a bear, or even another camper. The thing had dark grey skin and large skinny eyes that were so dark, they seemed to absorb the light. I'd say it stood at least 7 feet tall, and had very elongated arms ending with dangling fingers. Its legs were very lanky and appeared to be uneven and slightly twisted. Suddenly, it dashed very quickly to the side, managing to stay parallel and engaged with me. I dropped my flashlight and it's fucking shattered on a rock. The noises increased around me so I stepped backwards into the tent. It was wide open and Jen was not there. I broke down. There was silence again, so I got out of the tent gripped my knife and bear spray and put my back to a large tree. Not knowing what the fuck to do next, I just brainstormed for a minute. Softly, I heard Jen from the darkness. I'm over here. I looked and couldn't see shit. Yes, this way, she said. I blindly ensued in her direction feeling for trees and pushing through thick bush. I kept asking where she was, but she stopped responding. I focused hard and could hear a very quiet and deep breathing, so I went towards it. There she was, sitting cross-legged in a small clearing dimly lit by the moonlight. This is the greatest moment for us, she said with her head down. I love you. I put my hand on her shoulder asking if she was okay. Last night, I met our new family, and now it's your opportunity, she replied. Her shoulders were very cold, almost all at once, tall figures shifted out of the forest encircling us, their dark eyes elongated, and I had the irresistible urge to gaze deep into them. I felt so strangely relaxed. Though I quickly came to and was met with feelings of nausea and extreme fright. I grabbed Jen and tried to get her onto her feet, but to no avail. Where else would we go? She laughed. The things began to emit very high pitched noises in sync, which then transitioned into a deep hypnotizing tone. I began to lose consciousness and eventually fainted. After some time... I woke up in the tent. I can hear something hastily moving around me from time to time. Number 4 I was a very sheltered kid when I was growing up. My mum was your standard helicopter parent, but my father usually had a little bit more finesse about letting me think I had more freedom, even if he was still keeping an eye on me. More on that later. My mum worked at a standard 9 to 5 at the time, but my father was self-employed, so he usually arranged his hours to be home when I got back from school. I asked for $5 so I could ride my bike 10 blocks down to the nearby convenience store and buy a snack, something I enjoyed greatly because my father let me go by myself, so it was one of the few times I wasn't cooped up under the watchful eye of an adult. I was at the age where I was starting to want more freedom. My father received an urgent call from one of his clients and had to go meet with them. He gave me a quick speech about just going there and back and told me to call him once I was back home, but otherwise didn't seem too worried. We lived in a nice neighborhood and I'd made this ride many times before already. Then he's off. It was a windy day as I was winding my way through the neighborhood. 
I was two blocks away from the store when a car rolled up perpendicular to me out of one of the cul-de-sacs. Inside was a well-groomed man, maybe in his mid-thirties. He was wearing a bind-up shirt with a tie and was generally white-collar looking. He rolled his window down and politely asked me how to get to the freeway. I wasn't good with directions, so I just pointed down the road and said, Somewhere that way. If you keep going, you'll see it. While I said this, I noticed he had his hand on something odd looking down somewhat close to where the stick shift would be on a manual. I just assumed that's what it was and brushed it aside. The man rolled his car closer until the passenger side was only a foot from me and said, Sorry, uh, I didn't hear you over the wind. Starting to feel those instinctual spine tingles you get when something's wrong, but not wanting to be rude, I repeated myself. It was at this point that I gasped, and my whole body went numb. The odd thing his hand was wrapped around was not the stick shift. He was holding his penis, and was completely naked from the waist down. Still polite, he asked. Could you get in and show me the way? I rolled my bike backwards, stammering breathlessly. Uh, I, I, I can't. He replied. That's okay. And calmly drove off. No screeching tires, no attempt at a quick getaway, and he started to drive in the opposite direction that I pointed towards the freeway. Then, he was gone. I sped to the store and waited in the back for a few minutes before calling my father with their phone and explaining what happened to him. He booked it to the store and called the cops. The officer who responded said it was pointless to call without plate numbers or any other identifying information. He said the man was probably on the other side of town by now, trying the same thing on some other poor young girl. The especially weird part is later that night, my father confessed to always following behind me a certain distance so that I wouldn't notice. This was the first time he didn't. Thankfully, over a decade later, nothing involving this man happened again. Number 5 The story takes place a few years ago in 2013. I was almost 13 years old at the time, and my parents were leaving me home alone for one of the first times. If I recall correctly, they were going to some wedding and planned on being gone most of the day, but this isn't really important. Before they left the house, they told me the classic monologue of don't open the door to strangers and of course, call us if there's an emergency. I was too giddy to actually pay attention to what they were saying, so I just nodded my head yes and acted like I was interested. Eventually they left around noon and I was free to do whatever I wanted. So I went up to my room, popped my earbuds in, and started listening to music. Around two or three hours later, through all the ACDC I was listening to, I faintly heard the doorbell ring, followed by knocking. From the vigorous nature of the knocking, this person had either been knocking for a while, or was just an asshole. I step out of my room and go into the bathroom, where there is a window that looks directly down upon the front doorstep. As I peer out of the window, I must have either made a lot of noise opening the blinds or they were just looking in the right place at the right time because as soon as I looked out, I see two middle-aged Hispanic men standing on my doorstep. When I had looked out, I had made eye contact with one of them and in turn he alerted his body to my presence. As I close the blinds, I can hear them calling up to me in what I assume was English but they had really heavy accents on top of the fact that I was getting nervous. I couldn't really tell what they were saying. I was conflicted as to what to do now. The men had already seen me, so it's not like they were going to go away as easily. I contemplated calling my mum, because if my mum found out this was happening, she would never let me stay home alone anymore. All the while, these two guys were pounding on my door even harder. I crawl back into my room and get in the fetal position under my bed. The knocking goes on for at least half an hour and then stops. 
I noticed the sudden lack of banging and cursing and wondered if the men had finally left. As I crawl out from under my bed to look out the bathroom window, I fall flat on my ass as the entire house shakes as these men begin to slam against the door. Within two minutes, I hear the earth-shattering shriek of the door lock smashing open. I muffle a scream in terror as I hear two sets of footsteps proceed through the entrance and into my house. As the men scavenge through the house, I hide under my bedroom closet, having accepted my death at this point. This part of the story always gives me goosebumps retelling. One of the men says in Spanish, Do we go upstairs? What I'm guessing was his accomplice starts saying something in a muffled voice, and soon after the other replies, and soon after the other replies in the same tone. It goes back and forth like this for at least a minute, before I can hear the men moving again. But they weren't coming upstairs. Instead, I hear the far off distant sound of their footsteps going to the basement. The men re-emerge a good 15 minutes later. They do some more muffled talking, and then leave through the front door. I stay in place for what felt like years, but was probably only an hour. Finally, I step out of the closet and check the entire second floor for signs of being ransacked, but the entire second story is untouched. I brace myself for what I'm going to see when I go downstairs, but eventually I do. The first thing I notice as I walk downstairs is the door. It turns out the door itself hadn't actually been busted in, but the pane of glass at its center was. I'm guessing one of them broke it, and then reached through and unlocked the door. As I proceed through the house, I realize that hardly anything was actually taken, or for that matter, destroyed. It was mostly just miscellaneous things that I had trouble noticing in the first place, but the one thing I distinctly remember was the vase of flowers on the kitchen counter. It was smashed all over the floor, and water, glass, and flowers were everywhere. I then called my parents and told them some bullshit story about how I accidentally smashed the vase and the door window frame with a football. They freaked out and grounded me when they got home, and they said they were not going to leave me home alone anymore for very often. You're probably wondering why I didn't just tell them about the men and avoided the grounding. Well, I almost did at some points, but I thought they would think it was just some bogus excuse to get me out of trouble, so I never told them, and I'm pretty sure they never found out anyway. The creepiest part of this whole thing was that, after the men left, they left a flyer for their lawn moving business on the doorstep. These assholes broke into my house and still had the audacity to advertise their business to us. Classy. Hey guys, it's the Grim Reader here. I hope you enjoyed listening through that. If you did, please slap a like, and if you haven't already, why not subscribe to be notified of future uploads? If you have a story you want me to narrate, please send it to my email in the description box. Once again, thanks a lot for listening.